If you brought your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 19. Luke, chapter 19, and we're going to be talking about a guy that goes by the name of Zacchaeus, or Zach for short. Now, I got to tell you that some of you might be a little different, but you know, I have never really been a big fan of parades. Because every time I've arrived to one, I always just seem to have the same thought. We should have gotten here earlier. Because it doesn't really seem to matter what time you show up. All the prime spots are nearly always gone. There are, there are empty chairs and blankets that line the sidewalks where people have reserved their spots. Many times setting those things out the night before. They are the cheaters of our society. And whenever arriving after a large crowd has already formed, well, you know, you do the best that you can to fight for a vantage point in which you can get a glimpse of the best parade floats that Medford or Central Point has to offer. But no matter, of course, the young kids, well, they always want to see what it is that's passing by. And so if they're not able to get one of the, the prime spots along the curb, well, a lot of times you'll be able to spot them towards the back of the crowd, sitting upon mom or dad's shoulders. But what do you do if you're a grown man with just the stature of a young kid? Well, that was the dilemma that Zacchaeus faces in Luke chapter 19, as this parade route traveled down the main street of his hometown, Jericho. And we can't be certain exactly how short Zacchaeus was, but at the very least, well, many in here probably learned from your Sunday school training that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. So goes the Sunday school song. And he must have been shorter than 5'10", because we know that that's how tall Jesus was, which just happens to be how tall I am, so we know that that is God's preferred height for humanity. <laughs> Sorry, I just made that up. But Zacchaeus was a short guy who's going to have a wild encounter with Jesus. Because this impromptu parade was being thrown in Jesus' honor. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus has begun his final journey to Jerusalem, where he knows that he has the cross waiting for him. And he had to pass through Jericho in order to get there. And so if you're following along with me in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, it says that Jesus entered Jericho and he made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. Now that gives us just about all we need to know in order to really sense the, the tension that must have immediately been felt on the street when Zacchaeus dared to make himself a part of the crowd. Oh, he would not have gone unnoticed. As everyone waited for Jesus to pass by on the parade route, well, I imagine that Zacchaeus would have been audibly booed or maybe just resentfully glared at because this was the guy who had been robbing these people for years. 
See, they would have thought of him as being much more of sort of like a, a mob boss than they would a kind of IRS agent. The tax collectors that we read of in the Bible were, of course, a despised bunch. They were Jewish, and they collected taxes from their own people on behalf of Rome, which really wasn't so much the issue, even though everybody felt too heavily taxed by Rome. See, the issue wasn't so much in the taxes collected. It was in the handler's fee that they charged. Because Rome would incentivize people to enter this profession of tax collecting from your own people by permitting them to tack on whatever percentage they wished to pocket. And it was a cut that was normally quite steep. And if anyone took issue with it, well, these tax collectors were backed by the full force of the Roman army. They were hated because they were viewed as traitors to their own people, ripping them off to do the dirty work of the evil empire. In fact, the Jewish people were so appalled by the behavior of these tax collectors that they wouldn't allow them entrance into the synagogues, which in that time and culture meant that they would be cut off from God from worship, even from a meaningful social life. The moment they signed that contract with Rome, they would lose relationship, even being disowned by their own family and friends. And so we know this of Zacchaeus, that he was probably used to eating some really nice meat but he was probably also used to eating alone. And you may have noticed in there, in those, just those first couple of verses, that of course, Zacchaeus wasn't just any kind of tax collector. Oh, no, no, no. He was like the CEO of tax collecting, holding down the title of chief tax collector of this region, which is really saying something. Because if you just happen to be like an aspiring tax collector, well, this is the city that you would be trying to get to. Jericho was known as a gateway city. It was located about 10 to 15 miles outside of the capital, Jerusalem. And all of the roads that connected the eastern cities to the capital led through Jericho making it heavily populated, a whole lot of commerce, and there were a lot of tourists, making it possibly the most heavily taxed city in the Roman Empire. And so to say that Zacchaeus was very rich, well, could have even been an understatement. And yet, even with everything he could ever materially want, we'll notice that he was obviously still spiritually unfulfilled. And so it will be the case with us as well, that our hearts will never be fully satisfied by things. It's why Zacchaeus would dare to enter into and move among this crowd, where he would have been such an unwelcome guest. And then it says in verse 3 that he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead, and he climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. And this would have been such a bizarre scene for the people to observe. Because in that culture, it was considered undignified for any man with any kind of social, respectable kind of status to be actually seen running. They just didn't do it. Or let alone climbing trees, as you might see little kids doing. But it just gives us the sense of how desperate 
He must have been for something that he thought he might find in Jesus. How his heart longed for some kind of change. And we're not told exactly of what led to his curiosity in Jesus. Oh, this is one where I would have loved to know the backstory. But it was surely a curiosity that was placed in him by God. Because this encounter with Jesus certainly will not seem as any sort of just a chance encounter. But instead, much like a a divine appointment that God will have set up. And so too, it will often be our case that our spiritual curiosity comes from God. Chances are good, many of us could probably share some stories of how God sparked a curiosity in him. And we didn't really realize it at the time, probably. Oh, but now we can look back and we can see the people that just happened to come into our life at just the right time. Or maybe it was the conversation that just happened to take place when it did. It could even be the the circumstances or maybe the event that just happened happened to get us thinking of the possibility of maybe a relationship with God. I was a middle school youth pastor for many years, and I'd like to think that I have nearly seen it all when it comes to sort of initiating or creating a a curiosity or an interest in new relationships. Because the art of middle school flirtation um, ranges from very subtle to very bold. And it can be quite clunky and humorous at times. At first, a middle school boy, well, he might try to get the attention of a girl. And so he does the obvious. He pays her a compliment. Only the boys tend to compliment the most random of things, (laughs) making them just kind of come off as weird and creepy. And the girls, well, oftentimes they will completely overdo it because the boy might say something as, like, ordinary as, uh, video games are cool. (laughs) And she will lightly graze his arm and she will flip her hair Oh, you're so funny. (laughs) And the boy, the boy will remain completely clueless. It's why at the middle school level so often some more drastic measures have to be taken, especially for the girls. And so a friend is often sent out that acts as the scout And her mission is to be very simple and very brief. She is only to ask, so what do you think of my friend? Do you think she's cute? And of course, this might seem like really ridiculous to us, but it actually is uh, pretty effective in what it accomplishes because, you see, it certainly is able to gauge the boy's interest. But perhaps even more importantly, You know, if the boy hadn't ever really uh, noticed the girl before, oh, he is at least a little curious now. And I wonder how often God might try to get us to notice him. Or maybe it's spark our curiosity in him, or maybe it's spiritual things, but we are like as clueless as a middle school boy. And here is Zacchaeus, now up in the tree, and he leans over its branches to get a better view of Jesus because it was his curiosity 
that led him there. But Zacchaeus never could have predicted what would happen next. In verse 5, it says, when Jesus came by, he looked up. At Zacchaeus. And you know, of course, when Jesus looks up, well, everybody else is going to look up also. And so all eyes are now on Zacchaeus. And my bet is that when the whole crowd noticed what or who Jesus was looking at, oh, they probably all had the same thought. That's right, Jesus. You let that tax man have it. it. It was probably a lot like a nature scene where you see the lion corner a small prey up in the tree. That's probably how this crowd expected the encounter to go down. But then comes the surprising plot twist. And it says that Jesus called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. You know, Zac had probably showed up that day searching for some kind of value or significance in his life because he probably hadn't felt either in a really long time. No one wanted to be his friend. No one thought of him of any value. But here, Jesus uses his name, and I think so that Zacchaeus actually had the opportunity to hear, I know you. And of course, it wasn't just a simple, uh, like, I know about you. No, it was Zacchaeus, I truly know you. And as we'll see, it was really to accept him. When he likely hadn't felt true acceptance in maybe his entire life. I've witnessed also the first hand of the value of a name, again, when I was in youth ministry. Justin was this kid who would come to our youth group fairly often, and I enjoyed him. I liked talking to him. And I'd talk to him about things that uh, I had previously learned about him in other conversations that we had had up until that point. But I had gotten into the really bad habit of just uh, calling him dude or bro or by some other nickname. Because you see, I, I knew him, and I actually knew all about him, but I had forgotten his name. And I just happened to be very bad with names. And of course, you know, after you ask someone their name a couple of times, well, it just gets a little embarrassing to continue asking. And there was one night that I began talking with him, and he actually called me out. Not in a mean way, but he asked, do you even know my name? And I felt so horrible. I didn't feel horrible just because I, I may have a bad memory. I, I felt horrible because of what I may have inadvertently communicated to him. That you're not valuable enough for me to even remember your name. Now that, of course, is not the case. I'm just bad with names. But I feared that that's the way that I had made him feel. And so I had to tell him that I had forgotten his name. And I had to ask again, and this time, I wrote it down. And I carried that piece of paper around in my wallet for months. I began to use his name as many times as I possibly could whenever he was ear, in earshot of me. And it was, it was overkill, but I didn't care because I wanted him to know that you're known, you're accepted, you're cared about here. 
And now, do you know, I, just, I think of Justin every time I read this Zacchaeus story. Because that's what Jesus was doing. In fact, Jesus would even take it a step further just so there was no confusion over how much he cared. And he said, Zacchaeus, I must be a guest in your home. Because you see, such an act was an expression of friendship. It's why many times throughout the Gospels, the religious leaders would become so upset when Jesus would choose to eat with people whom they considered to be notorious sinners. And it's not as though Jesus was just looking for a free meal. No, he was actually choosing those people to be in his circle of friends. And so Jesus' message to Zacchaeus, and I would say even us today, is this. I know you. I know what you've done. Let's be friends. It's a powerful picture of the kind of unconditional love that God has for us. Because the Bible makes really clear that we're actually all notorious sinners. That none of us are really worthy of being with God or in a relationship with Him, and yet, He still loves us. And He's placed such a high value on us that He accepts us just the way that we are. The way that we come. In fact, look in Romans with me. Romans 5, 8. It'll be up on the screen there. It says, God shows his great love for us in this way. That Christ died for us when? While. While we were still sinners. Like is the case with Zacchaeus. Well, God doesn't require us to clean up our life before we come to him. As though we have to in some way, like, earn our way to him. He has invited us to be with him because of his unconditional love for us. It's a free gift. And God welcomes us with open arms. And he is then even patient with us as we would grow closer in relationship with him. But here's the catch. In case you're here wondering if there's some sort of catch, well, here it is. That as we grow closer to God, we won't be able to possibly remain unchanged. Once our hearts are drawn to Him, God develops a change of heart within us. I wrote it this way in your notes. It's that God has saved us to change us. Which isn't at all a reflection of God's dislike for us, but instead, it's actual result of how much He loves us. He loves us just the way that we are. But because He loves us as much as He does, well, He doesn't want us to just remain as we are. He always desires something better for us. I think a parent can probably immediately relate to this because we will always love our kids just as they are. There's nothing they can do to change the way that we love them. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be thrilled if they always remain the same. We know that if they're still doing life at 30, the same way they're doing life at 15, it's probably not such a good thing. And it wouldn't be very loving on our part as parents if we encourage them to just remain that way. It's because of our love that we want something even better for them. And God desires that for us. It's why after we've come to faith 
in him. And he then even walks us through this process of growing in our faith that we will so often begin to feel this strong conviction to become an even greater reflection of God's character. It's just the natural process of faith development, you could say, that as we grow in relationship with him, we grow to be more like him. And we can actually watch this principle play out in the life of Zacchaeus in a very short amount of time. In verse 6, it says, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. And meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Again, we're not given a lot of details of what happened between the tree and the house or exactly what went down in that conversation that he had with Jesus. All we can be sure of is this, is that something happened in Zacchaeus' heart to drastically shift his ambitions. Whereas he had been so driven to gain as much money as he possibly could, well now, he's suddenly determined to give so much of it away. And Jesus wasn't declaring salvation over Zacchaeus because of what he had decided to do with his money. This was Zacchaeus simply responding to the salvation that had taken place in his heart he had a change of heart. It's why you may have also noticed in those verses that Zacchaeus refers to Jesus as Lord. See, Lord is a title that indicates ownership. If we have declared God to be Lord of our life, then we have declared him to be owner of our life. And we then move into a management position. We begin to see our life and our blessings, and maybe it's our opportunities that we get to be good stewards of in order to honor and serve God with those things. See, just as any company, or maybe it's a team or an organization, will begin to reflect the personality of its owner. Well, so too, when we begin living our life for God, we become a reflection of him. In Romans 12, 2, it reminds us that we are not to copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but that we are to let God transform us into a new person by changing even the way that we would In other words, I like to think of it this way. You know, we should look differently or even strange to those people who aren't living their life for God. They should look maybe at some of our decisions or the way in which we would treat people, behave, maybe the things that we prioritize and think, huh, well, that's not. When I was in college, every now and then, when we, um, out in public, when maybe there was a big crowd around, my friends and I um, would do sometimes this silly walk. Um, and this all got started when uh, one of the guys of our crew exposed the rest of us to this stupid little video um, that's really old, and it was done by Monty Python. 
And uh, so I'm going to show you just a really quick, a really quick clip of the video because otherwise you may not understand. Um, and the quality isn't great, but you can at least get the idea. Here you go. Hi, please. Hi, as I have. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wondering, the uh, premise of this ridiculous little sketch was that the British government had created a whole government agency for the development and promotion of silly walks, which was, it was very ridiculous and stupid. But you can see how maybe a group of very immature guys might be inspired by such a thing. And so we too, well, we developed the silly walk. And we found that the secret to doing this was really just to have one guy do a silly walk. And then the rest of us would follow alongside of him, walk completely normal, as though we were completely oblivious to the silliness of his walk. And people would stare, and people would laugh, and the only point to this activity for us was to look ridiculous and different. And you know, we actually would have been extremely disappointed if no one would have noticed how ridiculous we looked. And I think that for those who are living for God's kingdom rather than this kingdom, you know, we probably should be really disappointed if others would just consider us normal by the word world standards. This is a thought that often sort of stretches me, and I think that I've actually shared it before in an, another sermon. But I think if I were to suddenly stop believing in God, like, I just decided that I was done with my faith. Would my life look drastically different? Now, new employment, yes. But I mean in terms of, like, what it is that I'm valuing, or what I pursue, or the way in which I would treat others. Maybe my perspective on things or this whole world. And if we are uncertain that our lives would really have to change much if God were to no longer be present in it, we're probably not allowing God to have a big enough effect on our life. Do you know it could be that we've declared him to be Savior but haven't really let him be Lord? Have we allowed ourselves to become under new ownership? As a result of Zacchaeus' declaration of Jesus to be Lord, well, he immediately looked drastically different to those around him. And I think his example shows us four ways that our heart will be changed as well as we too would pursue God as Lord. The first is that we will develop new values and priorities. As God changes our hearts to reflect his own, we will just naturally begin to care more for the things that God has a heart for. And do you know that God cares deeply about our heart. In fact, one of the way, main ways that God seems to sort of shape our values is many times by challenging the idols that he sees in our hearts. 
in the previous chapter of Luke, Jesus has this encounter with, with the rich young ruler. And he tells them that in order to really follow, well, he's going to have to give away all of his money and all of his possessions. Which hardly seems fair, does it? Because Zacchaeus didn't give all of his money away. It says he gave away like half. But you see, it wasn't really about the money. It was about the heart. And apparently, Jesus knew that because of what Zacchaeus had decided to do, well, he had obviously captured his heart. As Christians, we are to examine our hearts, Scripture tells us. Are there any idols in there that's keeping our heart from beating the same things that God is passionate about? The second is this, that we will become joy-filled. When Zacchaeus took Jesus home, it says in verse 6 that he was filled with excitement and joy. Which is one of the distinguishing characteristics of someone who is following Jesus. You can tell a difference in their spirit. And it's because joy isn't just an emotion that we feel. You see, it is something that fills our soul. Joy is different than happiness, of course. Happiness is always dictated by circumstances. So if things go well for me, well, I find myself happy. And if things go badly, I'm not happy about it. But joy can be a constant in our life despite the circumstances. Because no matter what it is that we may face, we know that God is always this constant presence in our life. I really love the way that Rick Warren defines the joy that is available to all of us through a relationship with God. And I'll put it up on screen. I didn't put it in your notes, but he says, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all of the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the determined choice to praise God in every situation. The third is Zacchaeus' story will also remind us that we will look different at times because we will look to right past wrongs. See, the first thing that Zacchaeus realizes after this encounter with Jesus is that he's got some things to make right. And I wonder if it was even late that night after Jesus had already left his home and darkness had set in that Zacchaeus began to make the rounds to all the little mud-bricked houses that he had previously barged his way into and demanded payment. Only this time, rather than pounding his fist on the door, it just became a remorseful knock. The couple, woken out of sleep, the husband hears the knocks and he quietly slips out from underneath his covers, covertly makes his way to the small little window in which he'd be able to get a view of the front porch. Pulls back that curtain, just a sliver, to see who in the world would have such urgent business at this time of night. Oh, and the panic that his wife sees on his face when he suddenly realizes it's Zacchaeus. What do we do? We got nothing left. He's bankrupted us already. And then comes another knock. The husband reluctantly opens the door. 
short little conversation ensues. The door is then closed. The husband turns back around to face his wife with a white envelope in hand, a shocked look on his face. The wife says, well, what is it? He came to say he was sorry. That he couldn't ever repay us for the way that he's treated us, but that he wanted, to have, wanted us to have this. And he opened up that white little envelope and he began to thumb through those large bills. And his wife asked, why the sudden change? All he said was that he had been with Jesus. And you know, there will be times people will be able to tell that we have been with Jesus by the way in which we look to right past wrongs. And it doesn't mean that we can reverse things or that we can necessarily make up for things. But it is a really powerful thing, is it not? to confess a wrong and to ask for forgiveness. To say, you know what? I chose to do things my way rather than God's way. And I'm sorry that I didn't treat you with the kind of love and kindness that God has for me that he has for you. We'll look to right wrongs. And the last is this that will develop a heart for the lost. See, Jesus puts a bookend on this story by saying in verse 10, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. See, God cares deeply for those who have lost their way. And when Jesus, know this, when he uses the term lost, you know, he never uses it in a derogatory way. In fact, whenever he says it, he uses it as a term of endearment. In fact, in Luke chapter 15, he tells three stories of lost things. A lost coin, lost sheep, and a lost son. And in each case, Jesus alludes to those things as being lost because they really matter to the owner. See, we wouldn't normally think of something lost unless it has value to us. If it's not a value, we don't really think of it as lost. It's just gone. But God has a heart for the lost. Because he cares deeply for those who have lost their way from him. And God wants us to develop that same kind of heart. Hey, does our heart ache for those who are far from God? Are we loving them the way that Jesus does? Are we treating them with the same kind of forgiveness kindness that God has shown us? Are we sharing with them the, the hope and the joy that we have found in God? The band can come forward and during this time of communion, let me just leave you with this thought. How will we look different because we too have been with Jesus. At Journey, communion is this time that we get to be with God, to quietly reflect on what he's done for us, the kindness that he has shown us. And so we take the little cracker and the bit of juice and we remember his body and his blood that he has given as a sacrifice for our sins. See, we remember that he gave his life so that we can have new life. And with that comes a change of heart. How will we 
look different because we too have been with Jesus. We'll give you some time to reflect over it with communion and then we'll end with a song. Lord, thank you for the way in which you love us. So much so that you would accept us just the way that we are, but yet you want something so much more for us. Thank you for your patience and your love as we would grow closer to you. And Lord, I would pray just as a body here that we would become an even greater and greater and more powerful reflection of your character as we grow together and as we grow in you. And so, Lord, as we come to you with these elements of communion, we say thank you. Thank you for the life available through your sacrifice, Jesus. And we pray, God, that as we would hold these two elements,